this on Facebook Live tonight. Uh, the intent of this informational forum is to share details of zoning, land use, and affordable housing, or better known as Section 8-30G of the Connecticut General Statute. And to introduce myself, I am Senator Tony Huang, and um, I am the ranking leader on the Planning and Development Committee of the Connecticut General Assembly with Representative Joe Zullo with cognizance over municipal and state policy interactions, and most importantly for tonight, in the area of zoning, land use, and planning. Uh, before we get into the introduction of the bills, uh, we're very lucky to have um, House Minority Leader uh, Vincent Candelora uh, joining us today. I want to be able to give Vin a, a, a welcome and an overview and, and having him participate. And, and then after him, uh, I want to be able to take a few minutes and have the state representatives uh, that are present, starting with uh, Representative David Iaccarino, uh, Senator Paul Ciccarelli, uh, to be able to introduce themselves in the towns and the districts that they represent and the roles that they have in committee. So thank you, uh, House Minority Leader um, Candelora. Thank you for joining us and um, welcome. Thank you, Senator. I, I greatly appreciate this. And thank you for putting this forum on um, from members of the the 12th senatorial or in the 34th senatorial districts. Um, you know, essentially we're here tonight to talk about the impacts that we're seeing on our local zoning laws. And I think there's just an overarching theme of really taking away choice, whether it be from families or from towns and cities. Uh, each of our communities are very unique and it's what makes, I think, New England quaint and distinct. Uh, and there is legislation right now going through Hartford that is essentially trying to create a one size fits all. So I just wanna thank both of you for getting this information out there to people so they understand the impacts that this legislation has on Hartford. Well, thank you for joining us and, and thank you for your tremendous leadership in a very difficult legislative session. Uh, Representative David Yaccarino, please. Thank you, Senator Wong and, and Joe Zulo, Representative Zulo and, and Ben and the whole team. Yeah, I'm, every town is, is uh, we have our own zoning laws and we should abide by home rule. And unfortunately, many times the state of Connecticut, you know, well, well intended, every town has different needs and wants in, in property like uh, structure and configuration. So it's a good, I think it's a good form that we can hash out the details, listen to the bills and uh, have a frank discussion. What works best for each municipal, you know, North Haven, the 87th district or your district in Fairfield or East Haven or, or Wallingford or North Granford. We're all different, but we all want to have housing and, and stability, but we all do it a little different. So hopefully it's a, uh, we'll have a good discussion this time tonight. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Iaccarino. And we have Senator Paul Ciccarelli. Uh, thank you for uh, making time and, and uh, in a car that's not moving, I wanna emphasize and um, welcome and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I do apologize. I am taking this from my car. Uh, we do have soccer practice tonight, but I did not want to miss this because um, it's very important. Um, as a ranking member on housing, this is also trickling into that committee um, and in too many bills. Um, so I thought it was very important to be here. I'm excited for the discussion. Um, and it's very important that we do keep control within the municipalities because they know their areas better than any. Um, and it's imperative that we uh, really understand what the consequences may be if some of these bills move forward. So I'm excited for the discussion and, and, and to learn a little bit more from my uh, great colleagues here. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ciccarella. And, and your work with uh, Representative Paletta in housing has also been uh, uh, painstaking, I, I guess, would be the best way to put it in some of the challenges you have. Uh, I want to be able to introduce my um, my uh, cohort in the, the Planning and Zoning Committee, uh, Representative Joe Zulo, a little his background as a, as a town attorney, uh, and also how he has been, you know, usually when we have these things, it's usually a, a compliment fest with Representative Zulo for the great work that he's done in uh, planning and development. But Representative Zulo, welcome. Thank you, Senator Wong, and it's always a pleasure to join you. You know, uh, I said it at the last Zoom, and it really is true. You know, while I really like to get into the weeds sometimes, and I, I enjoy the, the technical background of the bills, you really do bring a, a depth and breadth of understanding of the legislative process, which really helps, and especially when we're dealing with issues like that. So it's a joy to be doing these things with you. And uh, 
really excited to be talking about uh, spending another Monday night talking about preserving local control and uh, the zone of proposals we have, which uh, stand to potentially infringe upon that. So thank you again for joining us and lending your expertise. Uh, Absolutely. To the forum. And if you would join me as we'll kind of go and, and address these bills, if uh, our staff can put on to the shared screen onto the first bill, which is uh, Senate Bill 1024. Next slide, please. There you go. So Senate Bill 1024, it's an act concerning zoning authority, certain design guidelines, qualification of certainly land use officials and certain sewage disposal systems. Honestly, the, 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 the complexity of this bill and the breadth of this bill as long as the title is. It's also the signature bill of a coalition organization called Desegregate Connecticut. Uh, we'll simplify this from the standpoint, from the slide you see, it's really what I consider an insider's bill that uh, these coalition leaders have really worked closely with uh, leadership and, and, um, and the Democratic Party in, in, in regards to uh, zoning concerns. And, and the three big areas are transit-oriented development and, and as of right and the removal of parking requirements. What does that translate to English? That any of your towns that have a train station or a main street or a transit oriented bus stop and um, they would be allowed within a half mile radius of um, zoning uh, as of right approval. And, um, and then the removal of parking requirements that would facilitate local requirements when you develop and, and create density. We're happy to say that through the work in a bipartisan basis, we were able to remove this section from the transit oriented development bill, but it still lurks significantly. Another area of concern is uh, community sewage system capacities. It significantly, if not in some cases, nearly double the uh, environmental impact in regards to sewer and alternative septic system capacities for our communities. What it really does is simply increase the capacity to, to have higher density buildings. And uh, we have watershed concerns uh, for coastal communities or for um, uh, farming communities that are predicated on uh, well water and, and ledges. It can create significant fiscal uh, mandate requirements and costs to municipalities. Uh, another is it changes the word character uh, to physical sites and characteristics and architectural context. What it means is what, what you define as either farmland, uh, colonial, architectural, seacoast, those are characters of a community. And, and um, this is saying that the state through this bill can remove and define it to a physical site and characteristics. The fourth component that's not captured in this, maybe the next slide, please, uh, is, is not captured in this, is creating a work group that would comprise mostly of Hartford uh, uh, bureaucrats and advocates, housing advocates, well-intentioned advocates, but have never been in the community, do not have a local presence that believes that the mission uh, can be accomplished by setting state requirements and mandates. And Senate Bill 1024 is really the signature bill of desegregate Connecticut. Um, for people that have any questions and want to read more about it, um, they can follow us and we'll provide that detail to you. But Senate Bill 1024 is truly the signature bill of desegregate Connecticut. And I'll refer, I'll defer to Representative Zulo to talk about the next bill. Thank you, Senator. And, uh, you know, you said it from the beginning that, um, you know, the bill is as long as it's title and it's impossible to cover every single aspect of it. But I will also add that it, it uh, seeks to impose uniform parking regulations on every town and city. Talk about a one size fits all approach. Um, and it also seeks to allow uh, towns to be able to extinguish pre existing non conforming uses. So if you're a business in a residential zone, you've operated forever and a town suddenly decides that your business is no longer 
consistent with what their plan is for that zone, you could find your, your business shut down uh, overnight or at least after a period of time after public hearing. But the bottom line is that it, it, it does seek to impose a, a one-size-fits-all approach. And uh, I, I certainly appreciate your, your review of that. Um, House Bill 6611 is an act concerning a needs assessment and other policies regarding affordable housing and development. It is a proposal which is championed by the majority leader. And it, it essentially is a formula-driven approach to affordable housing. Um, again, the problem with it is that it's a top-down state centralized approach to it, whereas uh, whereby the, the state uh, Office of Policy and Management, which is a state bureaucratic agency, will essentially determine each town's fair share um, capacity, what, what their fair share of affordable housing will be. And you would think that they would determine that maybe based on the amount of open space in a community or vacant land or capacity for development, but that's actually not the case. What they look at is your brand list, the medium income, uh, median income in your uh, town, the percentage of your town's population before the poverty threshold, and the percentage of your town currently living in multifamily housing, among other factors. So it's like an income-based approach. And what it does is it seeks to essentially redistribute populations based on income without necessarily any regard for the actual capacity of a community, whether it be infrastructure or actual open space, vacant land, to actually accommodate development. And once that fair share need is assessed, it is up to each individual community to develop a plan to meet that fair share um, quota that, that set out. And uh, uh, essentially by October of 2023, 20, each town would submit that plan to OPM and then would, would apply uh, to the courts for a judgment of compliance with uh, the state's fair share mandate. What's most concerning is that application and that judicial process, process that follows because from the second you apply to the court, you are now stuck in this never ending quasi consent decree process of seeking court approval and fending off interveners who may apply to the court to intervene in your case to say your plan is unrealistic. Your plan does not actually meet the, the, what, what OPM says is your fair share. And uh, if you are found to be in compliance, you are not subject to other mandates under the statute, but you're subject to continued court jurisdiction as far as meeting those fair share requirements. And if you aren't deemed in compliance, uh, the, the courts can order any types of uh, remedial measures to bring you into compliance. Even more importantly, throughout the process, if you're not in compliance, uh, any a uh, number of quote, aggrieved parties, which can include developers, people entitled to uh, units under the fair share plan, even nonprofits, for example, potentially colleges who operate nonprofit legal advocacy programs can intervene to hold you accountable and seek your compliance. And worst of all, if they are successful, towns are on the hook for their legal fees. Uh, so I've joked all along, but it really is no joke that towns become cash pinatas um, for these aggrieved parties when they get hauled into court, because if they are successful, towns are on the hook for those legal fees. Um, it really is a, a, a dangerous precedent to be setting. And we've heard public testimony. We've heard from other legislators who are concerned about these legal fees, especially because there are towns across the state who haven't had land use appeals in years who suddenly would be hauled into court to, uh, to answer to the mandates that could be established under this bill. Um, it, it really is potentially very burdensome to, to municipalities across the state, especially small, uh, small municipalities and rural municipalities. Uh, so I will, I'll close with that. I will also note though that this bill started in planning and development it was sent to, I believe, to the Judiciary Committee, 
It did not get back out of the Judiciary Committee. However, there are certainly a number of other vehicles where we can see this language arise again, which I know we'll, we'll, we'll touch upon later. So, and, uh, and I want to follow on that same idea that uh, no bill is ever dead till the end of session. And I, we did get confirmation from the, um, from the uh, 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 chair, uh, one of the chairs of planning development that in its current form, it, it will not appear and, and exist. But it is the House Majority Leader's uh, bill, and, and in some form or way, the, the, the data points are chilly. So I'll use the example of two towns that um, has participants in this meeting today. Uh, uh, North Brantford will have a fair share requirement of an additional uh, 1,063 units, um, and Wallingford will have an additional 2,082 additional units. These are units in addition to your 10% A30G requirement. They are exclusive of A30G moratorium requirements so that you could be double hit um, because none of the statutes under consideration right now as it relates to zoning, land use and affordable housing uh, it considers any amendment or changes to A30G. But uh, under this fair share bill, which was defeated in judiciary because of the legal implications that had to go to judiciary, you're looking at potentially 2,082 units for Wallingford. And as I said earlier, uh, 1,063 additional affordable housing units in the town of, of North Brantford. These are numbers that are just, that make your head spin. So it, it really is one where um, state mandates and, and using simple formulas uh, on a regional basis does not truly reflect the efforts and the initiatives and, and the due diligence that uh, town leaders and, and local planning and zoning boards and various affordable housing task force in each town are looking to address the need of affordable housing in their communities. So we'll go to the next bill. Uh, House Bill 6107, which is an act concerning the reorganization of the Zoning Enabling Act and the promotion of municipal compliance. It, it addresses the statute of section 8-2, which um, is a precursor to A30G. And it, it really codifies and reinforces that um, enable zoning as a state right that they um, confer onto local municipalities. That has been a clear statement from advocates of this bill that that zoning is a state purview and right. And we grant that to local municipalities. Therefore, the idea of home rule and local planning and, and zoning control is, is non-existent because the state controls that. It also removes the work character. As we said in 1024, it got replaced by a physical and architectural characteristics. That was a compromise that I know I'm, I, that I myself suggested, but this, bill 6107 completely removes the word character so it is no longer considered an opportunity or a consideration for a rejection for projects that may be applied to uh, it also creates uh, a working group uh, from the office of policy and management which is the budgetary office of the state of connecticut but that office will convene a working group to develop and recommend compliance with a30g if you look at the composition of the working group on the bill, it is predominantly, as I said earlier on 1024, a, 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 a bureaucratic, Harford-centric um, working group of, of designees, as well as well-intentioned housing advocates. You do not have local municipal leaders, COG input, um, and, and local planning and zoning and watershed and conservation movement. It really is a state-level working group that would recommend, develop, and ensure compliance with A30G. So again, it, it creates that working group without municipal representation. Um, and for people that think about all the things that we're, we're talking about and say to themselves, there's just no way any of this is gonna happen. It's just a lot of political speak and no way would the state and, and these policies uh, be created and passed through and, and create such dramatic change and, and overrun 
of, of local planning and, and zoning regulations and home rule. But I can share with you that 6107 as a bill has existed in its current form for the last three years. And two years ago, um, it was passed through and had a bipartisan agreement that uh, did not have the full vetting um, as we did this year with Representative Zulo and I as the ranking member, we had a 24 hour public hearing that was closed out and nearly 70% of individuals and, 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 and uh, testimony were not, were not heard, that uh, people were denied a voice in this idea of, of uh, one party rule dictating the terms of the planning and zoning. But this bill, this exact bill, literally two years ago and three years ago, passed through with nearly a, a debate or public hearing input. So again, it's an example why these kind of meetings, these kind of informational forums are so important for us to raise awareness in the community because this bill existed and passed through without public input, without fully understanding the implications of this. And that isn't a good thing in my book. Component uh, advocates of this bill says, this has been through with a review and it's been approved and bipartisanly approved and it almost passed out of committee. Thank goodness it didn't because as you better understand it, it creates a overriding state takeover of, of local zoning rights in my opinion. So 6107 is another bill of, of significant consideration. Um, I want to go to the next bill, which is a finance bill. And since we have the opportunity for Representative, for Senator Ciccarelli, uh, to Ciccarella to be able to be present with us, we're going to go offline after Representative Zulo talks about Senate Bill 172. We're going to go to a housing bill that, uh, that uh, Rep, uh, Senator Ciccarelli could, could offer as well. That's not part of the slide, but to utilize his expertise as well. Representative Zulo. Thank you, Senator. And you know, I, I get a lot of the same comments by the way, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, are these bills really gonna pass or, or even I heard about them, but, but what's the big deal about them? And, you know, take it on their face. You know, I, I think everyone says, well, sure, we wanna promote more affordable housing. Sure, we wanna pr promote more diversity in housing. We want uh, different types of housing, middle housing, uh, multifamily housing, maybe even cluster housing, but it's all about how you get there. And uh, by example, Senate Bill 172 and a couple of other bills kind of give you an idea about how the state says we're going to get there. On top of Hartford bureaucrats saying, we're going to impose the top-down approach to zoning. We're going to tell you how to run your towns. We're going to tell you how to plan your towns. Now, through Senate Bill 172 and other bills like it, the state is saying, and by the way, on top of telling you how you're going to de develop your towns, if you don't listen to us, we're going to impose some pretty harsh penalties on your residents to essentially coerce compliance. Senate Bill 172 uh, sought to impose anywhere between a one to two mil tax on every single residential and commercial property in any town that doesn't meet the 10% affordable housing goal that's currently under 8-30G. Now, remember, the fair share bill sought to impose additional requirements. So this isn't under fair share necessarily. This is the existable, existing affordable housing framework. And there, the vast majority of towns in Connecticut do not have 10% affordable housing stock. So if you're one of those towns, if you're a Madison, if you're in East Haven, if you're in North Haven, I don't even, I don't believe Wallingford meets it. If you're any of these towns and you're a business or you're a home, you are, you would have been subject to an automatic one to two mill tax on your property because your community doesn't meet that threshold. Um, there are, there were a number of other bills that did the same thing. There was Senate bill 1068, which imposed anywhere between a four tenths to a two mill tax on all homes. Again, in any community, not meeting that threshold. And I think that says a lot about the approach uh, this year. This isn't something that's necessarily collaborative. This isn't something that's seeking, you know, uh, the input of local legislators, local CEOs, and trying to come up with, uh, you know, an incentive uh, motivated solution. This is literally a 
penal uh, solution. This is, if you don't do what we say, we're going to penalize you. And not necessarily your town. We're going to penalize every home, every business. Oh, and by the way, we're penalizing you just as you're coming out of COVID and need every bit of help that you can get. We're going to lump that on top. It's, uh, it's really a discouraging approach uh, to, to trying to solve our uh, affordable housing or meet our affordable housing needs in the state. Thank you, Rep. Zanzulo. And, and you're right. Uh, the more you know about it, as we've known about it, it really just is exasperating. But uh, I, I think, you know, we have a good working relationship with our colleagues uh, in planning and development. Um, I, I want to have uh, Representative Chicarella be able to talk about um, any specific bill of concern in housing um, and and uh, his experience and, and, and see if there's any parallel in regards to the idea that the state mandate uh, of taking over local control and, and planning and zoning and, and home rule. Senator? Thank you, Senator. And uh, yes, as I said earlier, when um, I, I was saying how important this forum was, there are bills that are in uh, the housing committee that talk about zoning regulations. Um, and we need to pay attention to the impact that, that will have. One of the ones specifically, Desegregate Connecticut, um, is going to take away the decision of the municipalities uh, and have the state, state make the decisions whether or not there should be a um, you know, multiple uh, unit apartment building um, in an area that, that would not fit the infrastructure, if you will. Um, so there, there are definite things in housing, but not only housing. I saw zoning stuff in transportation as well, and I'm not on transportation, but I, I've seen them there. Speak specifically, and I don't have all the bills in front of me, um, so, and there's quite a few. I don't know wrong, but there are multiple bills in housing um, that that touch up against zoning regulation. And, and the common theme, as I said before, is taking away the control of the municipality to make decisions about the areas that they know better than anybody. Yeah. Um, so specifically, I don't have the bills, bill numbers, um, but they, they are present for sure. Thank you, Senator. And uh, let me go right to uh, uh, House Minority Leader uh, Candelar. You've heard all of this. Uh, you're in a leadership role. Um, I, I, I'm just so eager to hear your thoughts and perspective um, and, and these bills and, and the concept of local planning and zoning and home rule and the idea of, of state um, uh, mandated and one size fits all. Yeah, I mean, I think generally speaking, we've always valued um, a state where local governments are the most important governments. And we try to govern from the bottom up. And over the last 15 years um, in the legislature under the Democrat control, I've begun to see the reverse policies. And I will say when it comes to zoning, um, I go back to the fact of how unique each community is. And how they're developed and what they value. Uh, in my hometown in North Brantford, we supply the drinking water for almost all of New Haven County. So a third of our property is in watershed. Um, and we had the good fortune of developing um, a, a Totucket Valley, which has been kept green through uh, our land preservation committee, purchasing up much of that land to protect that watershed. Additionally, our farms uh, engaged in, in the state programs that allowed for development rights to be actually removed so that the farms will remain farms for generations to come. Some of our farmers in our communities are, you know, we have one that's one of the oldest farms in the, in the country. And so those are just the values that were developed through that infrastructure. We don't have sewers. Um, we don't have um, the infrastructure for dense development. And yet this type of state top-down mandate is going to change hundreds of years of development in our community because Hartford is gonna tell us 
they know how to best develop the town of North Brantford. And, you know, we each, we value each community very differently. I also represent part of Wallingford um, and they have sections of town that are still pristine, has beautiful farmland, but we also have our downtown train station where the community looks to develop not just its businesses, but affordable housing in that region to use the public systems. So I think when towns are left alone, they do our best work. And unfortunately, uh, these type of policies are really gonna impact that local decision-making. Thank you. And, and um, your insight is, is very interesting about the watershed and the farming and the open space area. Have you gotten input, um, uh, Representative Candelora, from, from your local leaders in regards to their concern and awareness of these issues? Yeah, I mean, they've all expressed concern over that fact. We, we've expended a lot of money um, and even, you know, Representative Zulo and I can remember in East Haven um, with the Farm River and the flooding that we saw um, downstream in, in, the, in the Farm River Valley. Um, and North Brantford took um, remediation efforts to actually, um, you know, prevent that, that type of flooding. Uh, if dense development is required, that's the one area that you may see it, it, it occur. And uh, that's not good for the communities that are downstream from, from that development. So, you know, what we are doing as a state, um, trying to make this, this uh, you know, top-down approach isn't gonna work. And I think to the extent we need to look at affordable housing, uh, I think we need to sort of deregulate some of the, the laws that we have in place that are allowing the endless lawsuits each and every time a developer tries to develop land. Um, you know, we have a lot of conflicting interests that go on here and, and a different flavor of the month. You know, next year we'll be talking about giving environmentalists more power to prevent land development. And unfortunately, you know, this year we're gonna be talking about denser development on property where it might not be environmentally appropriate. Thank you so much. That is, uh... That is really an insight that, that, that is greatly appreciated. Uh, Representative Yaccarino, your Thanks, thoughts uh, and, and the towns that you represent and your perspective and context. Well, I represent North Haven, the 87th district, but to me, this listening to this and reading these bills is very concerning because you lose the autonomy of a community. The reason we have 169 municipalities, like I said earlier, we're all different, but maybe some people think it's well-intended, but it's, to me, I look at it as lawsuits, strong arming municipalities when you want to raise the mill rate, you know, two mills. It's a lot of money, for, you know, for people that work hard. And I think this, there's a reason we have local control and I prefer having local control, mainly because the people that are on, on the zoning boards, the boards of education, boards of uh, zoning boards of appeal, they all live in the community. You live in that community, so you know the community. People in the capital, they don't know Wallingford or North Haven, they don't know all of our communities are Fairfield. And I think it's local control. There's a reason why we have it, it works. And we have open, so much open space in North Haven, you know, we potentially could lose some of that open space. And then like Vince, uh, uh, Minority Leader Candelora said, you might have a year from now or two years from now that the environmental say, no, we want, you know, we need that land, which we do need that land. You can't get that land back. Well, I, so I just think that it's just, it's just very concerning to be honest with you because we have to get our house in order at the Capitol and we should leave municipalities to do their best work. And uh, I think it works better at local control and, and home rule. Does your community uh, uh, know about these proposals? Are they aware of the reach of these proposals? Because I'm finding that as we do these forums with Representative Zulu and I, so many people are not not aware or don't think it, it could actually happen in the state of Connecticut. I, this is a good question. I keep my our first selected Frida abreast to these these concerns. He's aware, but the planning and zoning, you know, we haven't. I've had a, Senator Chigrell and I give an update at our uh, town committees every month. And we did give an update last month about you know potential bills and the concerns of these bills, and I would keep them up to date on it. But I think if the majority of the population knew these proposals, it's very frightening. Again, not that you don't want to have affordable housing, or you know. But it's back, there's only so much, so much land, every municipality is different. And I would think it would cause more lawsuits. It's happened in our town. We've had lawsuits and it, it becomes a, a, you know, a, a, many times a tough situation for the community. Yeah, and, and uh, 
I, I, I will say this uh, for myself and, and many of my colleagues on the Planning and Development Committee, uh, I, I do acknowledge that we have a housing need in right. the state of Connecticut. <laughs> and we have a housing need that doesn't just exist in our suburbs, it exists in our cities, it exists in our rural areas, and that the idea of the state mandated top down, one size fits all, is misplaced. And ultimately, I think for us to get to a solution, it needs to be a collaborative effort with neighborhoods, local, state, right. and federal parties to get engaged in creating solutions. The status quo obviously will not stand, but nevertheless, the current proposals afoot um, is a, a, a state mandated uh, hammer uh, or a stick rather. Um, uh, and I want to raise a question that was raised on the chat with the various members. And I know that Representative Zullo, along with uh, uh, Senator Ciccarello and, and uh, Ciccarella, along with others, had made. What solutions have you provided in regards to housing solutions? Uh, I know that in housing, uh, Representative Zullo, which you also are, are uh, a member of, you did propose a number of bills leading to home ownership. And the idea of being able to create and creating equity and opportunity for people to be able to get access to housing um, and creating that methodology. Can you talk a little bit about the solutions? So, because it's important, it's not simply us saying no to these proposals offered by these various coalitions and uh, the majority Democrat, but also being able to provide an al alternative solution to creating. Uh, opportunities and, and addressing the question at hand. So Representative Zula, could you talk a little bit about the vision that you had and the solution that you provided, but unfortunately was never um, uh, debated or, or, or raised as a committee move, bill moving forward? Sure, you know, um, we have a great program in Connecticut through the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority uh, where first time home buyers can access loans at a half a percentage point below essentially the market rate, and who can also receive uh, down payment assistant second mortgages uh, so that they can essentially come to closing with very little money and can have their closing costs, attorney's fees, down payment paid for uh, through a secondary loan, again, at a, at a rate well below the market. And it's a great program. And loans that are subsidized through the state in this fashion, fashion actually count towards a community's affordable housing stock if that person takes advantage of that loan and, it sub and actually goes on to buy a, a house. Um, one of the problems though, is that lenders don't like to utilize these loans because their profits, their fees under those loans are capped. So they're not the first loans out of the gate that they recommend to people. So one of the proposals to encourage home ownership and to help communities build their affordable housing stock that I proposed was that uh, towns be allowed to incentivize homeowners to use these loans by offering a tax credit to any homeowner who purchases a home up to $500 tax credit using a first time home buyer loan, which I felt would A, incentivize homeowners to buy these properties and B, provide you know, a, a, a tax break to first time home buyers as they're trying to settle, in, uh, settle into communities, build their families um, and enjoy their first homes. But you know, recognizing that uh, it's not just about home ownership, uh, another proposal that I, have put forward, not in a, in a formal bill, but amongst ranking members and to leadership, was that you know we need to get Department of Housing involved in this process. We need to get Chaffa more involved in this process. Every year, they make tens of millions of dollars available to large scale developers to build large scale uh, affordable housing. But you know, zoning is local, and we keep talking about the fact that we need local control. Well, what about uh, minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, developers who aren't building 50-unit complexes but want to rehab a house, you know, a corner away from Main Street. We need grant programs available for those type of types of developers who want to invest in their communities but don't have 40 or $50 million to pour into a project. I believe that there are funds at the state level that we currently have in our budget that would not require any new taxes that we can reappropriate to help smaller developers, uh, homeowners, to repurpose their properties as multifamily housing, 
uh, middle housing to meet the state's affordable housing needs. And I think that process is what you were just referring to before that the process needs to be collaborative. It needs to be a collaboration between DOH, CHAFA, municipalities, CEOs, uh, federal stakeholders, our federal delegation to make these monies available to accomplish this. And the way it gets accomplished, again, is through local control, through that local input. It's the local uh, zoning boards and the local developers who know which houses, which tracts of vacant land, which neighborhoods are ripe for development, and the ones who are really going to care about the communities when they develop those properties. So the second proposal, again, is really a local-centered approach that says, let's empower local people, local businesses, local developers to make the change that we're seeking across the state and in our communities. Thank you, uh, Representative Zullo. And, and, and I want to publicly offer my commitment that uh, we are looking for solutions. We're not simply saying no. We recognize there's a need to address affordable, accessible, and diverse housing in every one of our communities. But right now, the idea of a top-down state mandate is, is too much. Uh, one of the questions that came up is, and, and this was available for everyone, is the, uh, the idea that uh, this is an example of the state overreach. Um, it is consistent with many other aspects of the state overreach. Uh, what is your reaction to that? And, and what do you say needs to be done on that kind of an overreach uh, beyond local input and control? You know, Senator, it's funny. You talk about state overreach and you think of the sugary drink tax. You, th you, you think of all of these ways that the state has tried to pry into our health decisions, pry into you know, every facet of our life. Um, and, and the way they most often do it or that it most often does it is they try to impose a tax. They try to make it financially uh, burdensome to continue on with a certain course of contact. We're seeing that now with TCI, which essentially amounts to a gas tax. They're, they're looking to change behavior by making it burdensome uh, at the pumps, putting an additional burden on people at the pumps. And, you know, again, it, it's just an additional uh, example of overreach, uh, but now we're seeing it in the form of zoning. Um, so I, I would say that I agree. It, it it amounts to state overreach and it amounts to the state trying to tell you what drinks to drink, what kind of cars to drive. And now in your community, exactly the types of zoning that you're going to have on your main street, maybe near your transit station, or if you're not, if you don't have a main street corridor or a transit station in your rural community. Uh, Representative Yacarino? Yeah, what happens when the state overreaches, many times it's not always, it ends up costing the consumer, be it for soft drinks, fuel, but even housing, more money, because they might think they know the community are doing the right thing, but what they're doing is really causing another financial burden. And many times that's why housing is so expensive to begin with, either in the city or the towns or the, or the rural areas. You know, it's, it's the more burden the state puts on a municipality or each individual or individual rights, the more burden it eventually costs you in the wallet or pocketbook. And I, I think that their policies, I've seen it for 11 years where they'll impose something and you end up, it ends up costing the consumer or the citizen more money. And it's much more difficult to live in this community or any community for that matter. And so it's just an overreach. Um, and it's, it's, I, don't, I think they should have a conversation with municipal leaders, maybe folks on the planning and zoning boards before they propose some of these pieces of legislation. They're not workable, I don't believe. Yeah. Representative Candelora? Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think Take government overreach. But what we've heard today is um, one of the distinguishing differences, I think, between the parties and what we're seeing for proposals. You know, Republicans want to incentivize um, and allow for the free choice. When people are left up to their own devices, uh, they will make the decisions that are, that are best for them. And we want to provide those tools to have them make the best decisions whether it be through um, you know, uh, incentives for being able to buy a home or through tax credits um, versus this top-down approach, which penalizes people to dictate the outcome that you want. And so right now we're having this conversation revolve around the zoning laws. We certainly could extend it to the gas tax that we've seen proposed. 
and many of the other type of uh, proposals that take away prevent parent parental choice, whether it be in healthcare. Um, and I think it, it is a distinction that, that Connecticut really is going in the wrong direction. Um, and so um, we should be concerned about not just this local, local zoning proposals, but what these impacts have on the general philosophy of free choice in the state of Connecticut. Thank you. Senator Ciccarella. Thank you. Um, and, you know, the overreach is definitely a, a huge issue. Um, and, and I'm sure that these are intended for good. As we understand affordable housing is necessary, we have young professionals, teachers, first responders, we want them to live in the communities. Uh, and be able to do so uh, Zoom world. and not be burdened by the, the high costs of home. You're, you can't hear me? You're just freezing. Can you hear me? In my hair, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, good. So uh, it does make sense that we want to have the affordable housing, but we can't have it at the cost of the middle class and uh, the unintended consequences of the bills. I believe it's SB 87, which is about child and, and group um, daycare facilities, which is an infringement on the zoning regulation. So essentially um, you could live in a 55 year old community um, and these new rules and regulations will supersede the guidelines of the condo association or the, the uh, elderly community. And you could essentially put a daycare in a 55 and older community. And that's an example of the overreach and the unintended consequences, um, you know, sometimes can have way more negativity than the positive intentions. Um, it's saying you can have 25 kids in a, a one bedroom apartment. There are safety regulations. There are issues that will come from this. And, and it's a, a clear example of the overreach. Um, and that's just a great example of that. Again, we, 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 we do understand the need for the affordable, affordable housing, um, but, but at what cost? And as as uh, Representative Zulo said, there are other ways to accomplish um, those good intentions. And we need to hear all sides of those ideas. Thank you. And uh, one additional question uh, uh, comes from environmental uh, concerns. Uh, I think one of the, I mean, we are all very much supportive and sensitive to unique, uh, unique geography and, and the environmental protection watershed areas. Representative Candelore mentioned about North Brantford. Um, these kind of increased density as it relates to sewer capacity and alternative septic systems, um, and and really the 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 significant increase of impact to accommodate density. What are your thoughts and concerns in regards to your knowledge of your community? And and uh, I think one of the components of the bill uh, of one of the bills we talked about that in order to accommodate the sewer uh, capacity, the town would be responsible for creating that infrastructure, ergo another increased tax burden on the municipalities. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on the environmental impact and open space considerations of these type of proposals? Well, what's interesting is, you know, the state of Connecticut has a state plan of conservation that we all know each town reviews and gives input of what that state plan should look like. A town like North Brantford, its entire community is almost consisting of a conservation zone, which means for the last 50 years or however long the state plan has been developed, um, state dollars cannot be used for infrastructure development. So the town of North Brantford could have, we never had the ability to utilize state funding to develop water or sewer lines because we were in a state plan of conservation. Um, and that's why our town looks very different than a town like Brantford that is just south to us, that has a sewer system, has the infrastructure for this type of dense development. And so at the state level now, a, a small community like mine, which is suburban rural, um, which has really been penalized over the years by not being allowed to use any state money for development, which was okay. We created our own character and our own values for our community. Now we're gonna try to pass laws that are gonna penalize 
these communities yet again who were not able to, to be developed and frankly, who are sort of the gem for our environmentalists because you know we have lakes, glacial lakes in my community um, that Yale University util utilizes for studies. Um, and those are the type of things that have been preserved um, just 10 miles outside of New Haven that's utilized to suggest now that we should be punished uh, is wrong. And, and that's where the state is short-sighted or the Democrats, frankly, and they're, they're um, duplicitous in, in what they want to promote at any given moment. Thank you. Uh, uh, Representative Kendall, I have to tell you, I thought I knew North Brantford. I learned so much about the nuances in, in regards to the watershed. You know, we're, we're, we're so, we're so biased in ways of, of representing our district and community. And I talk about Easton, Weston, and, and the watershed area, the reservoir, but I, I did not know that um, North Brantford was such a, a important um, ecological um, uh, conduit to the water structure of, of uh, the New Haven area. You don't get enough credit. And uh, you're right, the idea that, that the, the office of OPM and the working group is trying to create a one size fits all and don't know anything. And look, I've been involved in, in housing and planning and zoning, but I didn't know enough about Brant North Brantford as you articulated. I, I've added such new insight to this. So um, I can't imagine how uh, budgetary people and, and housing uh, advocates that, that don't live in your community can make decisions that impact your community as I've just learned today. So thank you for educating me and also sharing with people the real concerns of why these one size fits all is not only um, unpalatable, but potentially irreversible damage, uh, damaging to our communities. So um, Representative Yaccarino, Representative Zulo, your thoughts and uh, Senator Ciccarella on the environmental? The environmental, I mean, and like I said, we have quite a bit, of, our town was a rural town like North Grantford at one time, one time, but we had a, quite a bit of land developed. We do have some affordable housing which was on one of the farms in the eastern part of the town, which worked out well, actually. But as far as the environmental, like I said earlier, we only have one land. And when you have totally transform the landscape of the community or, or lose a watershed or lose open space, we're well intended, but you can't get that land back. So the environmental, uh, does, it's a big cost. You know, we all want to have, we had a project in North Haven, NOAA, North, North Haven Affordable Housing. It worked out really well. There's a little, uh, there's contention at first, but it worked out well. The house, the housing's really nice. Everybody's happy, but there's only so much space. And I believe in trying to preserve your, your, your integrity of a community and you can't get land back. Uh, and so you need that balance, but it's, there's only so much space you have to build, to build a housing and sewage. And I live on a street where it's all, we have all wells and septic. I would love to have sewers, but it's just not in the area. Now this town's not going to pay for that. Either the homeowners have to pay for that or the state's gonna pay for that. I don't believe the state's gonna pay for it. The whole area where I live is all septic and, and well, but the state's not gonna pay for that and the town's not gonna pay for that. The, the, you know, the homeowners will have to pay for that. And so it, it, there's an impact. I believe there's some language that will place the burden on the municipalities to provide such an infrastructure. But the, then they would just raise taxes. Taxes would go up. And then the people you're trying to help that are moving there, their tax is going to be so high. You, you, you see what I'm saying? The tax burden is going to be higher. It's a double edged sword. Yes, yes. Uh, Representative Zulo, represent, uh, Senator Ciccarella. You know, Senator, I'll, um, I'll say this there's a reason why, under some of the proposals, uh, they seek to move or uh, extend the jurisdiction of the, the Department of Public Health over community sewerage systems, increase the capacity. So right now, up to a certain capacity, uh, Department of Public Health can regulate. And then after that, deep Department of Environmental uh, Protection has to regulate. And there's a reason for that. And that's because deep has particular expertise, a, a particular scientific background um, that, uh, you know, allows them to evaluate proposals that may have a larger impact on the environment. And you know what the framework of the proposals this year seeks to do is essentially change the goalposts. It says, well, even though we've said that 
deep are, you know, is the agency that we trust the most to, um, you know, handle issues of this concern and sewage, you know, evaluate sewer systems of this size. We're going to transfer that to the Department of uh, Department of Public Health. Now, listen, Department of Public Health, you know, COVID, other issues. Absolutely. You know, there's a reason that, that, we, that we trust that department. But here we have deep whom we've trusted for years to evaluate sewer systems of a certain size. And we're saying, well, we're going to change that. And the reason we're changing it is because we have a policy, you know, we have a, a public policy that we want to promote. And maybe we don't care so much about the environmental consequences now. So we're going to move the goalposts and say, ah, eh, Department of Public Health can handle it now. Do they have the staffing? Who knows? Do they have the expertise? I'm sure we have a lot of bright people in there, but do they have the particular expertise to handle this particular issue? I don't know as I sit here. And I don't know that anyone's necessarily asked those questions or pushed push those issues. So do we care about the environment? Yes. Do we care about the environment when it doesn't necessarily facilitate the issues that we're seeking? And, I, and I'm saying hypothetically, Maybe that's a question that people need to be asking as they look at some of these proposals this year. Well, intention, of course, but uh, uh, you know the 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 consequences of these policies. There's a reason why we have the local input; they know best. Um, uh, Senator Chicarella, your thoughts on that environment? Yes, briefly, uh, just as you said it to uh, Representative Candelora about how much you learned about the watershedding in North Brantford and how important it is to New Haven and the surrounding towns. Again, to reiterate, local knows best. And in House Bill 6430, extending the jurisdiction for the uh, housing authority uh, is going to take away the ability um, to protect those open space areas that have an impact on the environment and the municipality. Um, you know, certain areas cannot withstand uh, large enough um, sewer or water supply or first responders and other type of uh, necessities. And it's going to come at the cost of those towns to facilitate that uh, without taking into consideration, again, what is going to come from making these decisions. And again, that's going to impact a lot of towns. They're talking uh, 10 miles um, from New Haven. So that touches East Haven, that touches North Haven. And if you move into other areas, um, Bridgeport, it's going to touch all those surrounding areas. And the cities may not understand the, the necessities and the needs of those smaller towns, as well as the zoning boards and, and the uh, health departments and the municipality. And that's a great example of how a lot of different things are affected from environment to finances to uh, public health. Um, so again, it's, it's imperative that we pay attention to this and, and really let everyone understand there is good intentions, but at what cost do we have to pay? So we have to really make sure we could, we could work together to, to protect the interests of everybody. Thank you, Senator Chicarella. Uh, and, and, and if I may, I, I, uh, we're nearing the, the end of our, our segment. Uh, I also want to offer and, and offer my perspective on something that is near and dear to me. Um, as a first generation immigrant, um, as a racial minority, um, and, and been very involved in housing for the last and, and, and planning and development for the last eight years of my legislative career. Uh, one of the main themes that's been discussed is the sense of social equity and, and accessibility and diversity. Uh, I will share with you, those are values that are deeply important to me. Um, they're important to me from a context of, of social experiences and, and the challenges we have. Uh, it, it exists in our culture. Um, and were there opportunities I can share with you literally almost 30 years ago, I was redlined when I looked at a Fairfield County community um, and, and it existed. We've had a history in regards to many municipalities throughout the state and this country that have addressed some of the vestiges of, of race and, and social equity concerns. 
But I can absolutely unequivocally share this, that these bills that we're talking about addresses or purport to address a problem that is significant in those areas. None of these bills address affordable, accessible, and diverse housing. So it's important to talk about the issues and not be um, uh, riled by the emotion of uh, social consequences and important things that are part of our very fabric that we need to accommodate. I felt it was important for me to address as the ranking member in planning development and, and um, been involved in these kind of discussions as I pose them. I pose them because these are bad policy from a state mandated top down uh, removal of local input and in what is in the best long term interests of communities. It is not because I have looked away and not addressed the issue in regards to social equity and, and opportunity. I am all for that. And I will stand anytime with anyone and work toward finding those solutions. I felt it was important to share that because somewhere along the conversation, we have moved away from what potential implications and removal of local input, uh, local community input, personal property rights, as well as environmental land open space considerations to these issues that are important social fabrics. But, but none of these have solutions to those issues. And I'm eager to, to be a part of the solution to those, but these proposed bills do nothing in that regard. Um, I wanted to close on that for me as a personal statement to, to, to clarify and to offer to people that may say we need to do something. We do need to do something, but these bills being proposed afoot do not address the problems we're trying to, uh, trying to present and address. And I welcome anybody else's input on that. But I felt it was important to, to kind of address that. Sometimes doesn't get said and sometimes drives people's policy making that is not based on facts and real solutions that are addressing the problems at hand. You know, Senator, I'll take the opportunity to chime in and close out on my portion by saying that it was actually you who brought it to my attention that there was very little quantitative data to actually back up the proposals we've seen this year. You know, and you know, as you mentioned, we want solutions. We're not obstructionists. We're not looking, sitting here just saying no, no, no. But show me the proof. You know, show me why these proposals are going to work before we go out and infringe upon municipalities, you know, local control and, and home rule rights to 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 put to impose these things. And sadly, there is very little data to substantiate that any of the pro proposals we're seeing this year are actually going to do something to meaningfully. Uh, integrate communities to empower uh, individuals uh, to obtain uh, new and diverse and affordable housing. And so that's something we're looking for. And uh, I want to thank you for that perspective. And, and, and again, and I said it at the beginning and I'll say it again, it, it's, it's because you bring that experience to the committee. You've said it before. These, pro these proposals aren't new. You've seen a lot of them in other forums in prior years. And uh, I, for one, will say I'm very um, appreciative to have your, your input, your guidance, your, your perspective in this process. And I know it's going to be invaluable as we come into the home stretch these last four weeks, um, you know, as we see the, these proposals try to advance. So I just want to thank you for offering me the opportunity to uh, participate in this. I've learned something new every week as we've done this. This week, it was about Rep. Candelora and, and the importance of <laughs> of North, North Cranford and, and the New Haven County watershed. I did not know that before, uh, but in all seriousness, thank you for, for hosting these forums, for, for, for prodding us all to be a part of it. It's important that we do this. So thank you again. Well, I, I wanna extend my compliments to you, Representative Zulo, and, and your insight and leadership and, um, and, and, and the, the wisdom of uh, uh, House you know, Minority Leader in choosing you uh, to be the ranking. You have been absolutely, incredibly helpful. So I, I'm grateful to have you. And look, this is a collaborative effort. And we have invited Democrats um, and, and Democratic leaders and, and state representatives, state senators to join us in these forums. Look, this is not a Democrat Republican issue. It's about local control and planning and zoning, protecting our environment, 
and ultimately people's personal property rights. So uh, again, I, I can't say enough about thanking you, Representative Zulo, but also uh, what an honor and, and appreciation for uh, the House uh, Republican leader, uh, Vince Candelora, to join us. And uh, if I could, asking each of the respective representatives how your constituents and, and people in this program could reach out to you to get your perspective and, and to keep and share their perspective and ideas with you as well. So um, uh, House Minority Leader, um, can you share your contact information? And then we'll sure. go to um, <laughs> Representative Zulo, Yaccarino, and Chicarella to end it. Sure, uh, repcandelora.com has all of my contact information on it. And you could also reach my office, 1-800-842-1423. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong and, and Representative Zulo for putting this forum on. It, it is greatly appreciated to get this information out to the people. Thank you. And uh, uh, oh, uh, Zulo, go ahead. Go, go, Joe. Go ahead, Joe. Thank you. I was just going to chime in quickly. My handle is the same no matter where you look. It's State Rep Zulo. So that's staterepzulo.com, State Rep Zulo on Facebook, State Rep Zulo on Instagram. And thank to, thanks to a number of issue advocacy groups, my cell phone is now public knowledge. So yeah. I'm sure oh, you really? have that anyway. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. Oh. Yes. Um, not a big deal. I, I, I welcome it. I have taken hundreds of calls over the last month on a number of issues, and that's okay with me. So please reach out. I appreciate it. And again, thank you, Senator, for including me. Your good support, Representative Zulo. Representative Yaccarino. Thank you, Senator. And thank you. I'm wonderful to present participate, I think this is an important issue. And I think we all care. We wanna have solutions instead of mandates. So, or we need to work together as a, as a legislature and as a community. My contact information is my cell, which everybody has, 203-980-0030, or dave.yacarino at housegop.gov, or just rep, uh, daveyacarino.com. But thank you, and we need to work together. It's so important. When you work together, you get better results. And Absolutely. Uh, Senator Chicarella, who I want to applaud and thank you for your uh, remarkable diligence uh, uh, sitting in on a Zoom while watching a soccer game. Uh, I, I think it's, it's one of the common um, uh, misrepresentations that the legislature <laughs> is a part-time job. For anybody who does it, it's, it's a full-time labor of love. So thank you very much for uh, uh, making the time and effort to join us. But how do people get in touch with you, sir? Thank you very much. And, and it's a practice and I'm the assistant coach. So I'm going to really get in trouble here. But again, it was very, very important to uh, attend here in this here. My daughter getting in the car. So I do apologize. Um, but it is Senator And my cell is 203-996-9927. And I've already been hearing a lot. I've been getting a ton of emails and a ton of phone calls uh, from from our constituents that are hearing about this and are very concerned. Um, so again, thank you very much for, for allowing me to attend and it was very informative. Thank you and, and thanks for taking time as, uh, as a coach and, and being there for us. Thank you very, very much. Uh, for all those people that are there, uh, thank you very, very much. You've got the contacts. Um, I hope we were able to share some insight and information. Uh, if you need more information, you've got the contact information for all the colleagues. I wanna thank, uh, uh, the, the House Republican uh, um, uh, staff, as well as Senate Republicans for being able to host this. So thank you, everybody. Have a great night. And we've got a whole week of session coming up. Good night. Good night, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.